Good morning, Sherlock. Endocrine disruptors are special chemicals. They are encrusted in thousands of consumer products. Bisphenol A became the most famous when it was banned from baby bottles. But that was just a trifle. They are in cosmetics, plastics, pesticides, everywhere. There may be hundreds of them seeping into bodies, into nature. Blood, umbilical cords, breast milk, rivers, polar bears, your mother, were surrounded. Endocrine means hormonal. Endocrine disruptors hijack the hormonal system and play with hormones such as testosterone and estrogens. Fetuses are the most vulnerable, those who don't have the choice. Unborn children, that means us. If our hormones are disrupted during pregnancy, they can leave a ticking time bomb which will explode inside us years later. Infertility, genital abnormalities, breast, prostate or testicle cancer, precocious puberty, developmental problems, obesity, diabetes. Endocrine disruptors are all suspected culprits. Europe promised to protect us, the future generations. But something went wrong. Your mission is to go back to 2009 and find out why. Good luck! Good luck. At the European level, the debate about endocrine disruptors started uh, way back in the 1990s with alarming signs of declines in male uh, fertility and also about uh, endocrine disrupting effects in fish, particularly in uh, UK rivers. Male fish all of a sudden were shown to make female egg yolk protein. This was really strange. And a lot of concerns arose from that. There are so many, literally thousands of studies that have shown the adverse effects of endocrine disruptors uh, on wildlife and, on, uh, and also humans. Uh, and since this is a very powerful effect as it intervenes during development and creates irre irreversible effects, that we can just no longer ignore this and, and have to act. The diseases in humans we are concerned about in connection with endocrine disruptors concern uh, malformations of the penis in boys, non-descending testes, testis cancer, for example, prostate cancer also, and in women, uh, breast cancer, uh, polycystic fibrosis and disorders of this kind. It has to be stated that among scientists, among practitioners of endocrine disruptor research, there, there is really a very broad consensus. There's a broad consensus about that these chemicals are dangerous and that they require a special approach in chemical regulation. My mission report starts at the European Parliament in 2009. The members of the Parliament decide that endocrine disruptors should be regulated, some even banned. It's high time for us future Europeans to be protected. But how do you recognize an endocrine disruptor from just any other chemical? Europe needs a special tool to spot them wherever they're hiding. In the toaster, toothpaste, or in yesterday's leftovers. The tool in question is an official definition. The European Commission has until the end of 2013, no longer, to find the words. There is great speculation at the moment um, among regulatory uh, bodies in Europe uh, how many chemicals would be caught out by uh, regulation as an endocrine disruptor. The truth of the matter is, uh, no one knows. The big deal about this is that it will basically be an official system of saying, yes, this is an endocrine disruptor, and no, this isn't, and yes, this one is a suspected endocrine disruptor. And we don't have that until now. When we make criteria for identifying endocrine disruptors, we'll be the first in the world uh, to have them. And therefore, being the first in the world uh, has 
a number of business benefits. It also has a number of potential costs. Le dossier de la perturbation endocrinienne est un dossier qui concerne l'ensemble des secteurs d'activité. Et si on prend la chimie, donc euh, le secteur de la chimie générale, les cosmétiques, euh, l'industrie pharmaceutique, les produits de protection des plantes, donc les, les pesticides, euh, les biocides que l'on utilise donc à la maison pour les mouches, les cafards, les, les moustiques, euh, sont donc tous concernés à des degrés variables d'ailleurs par cette fameuse perturbation endocrinienne. The industry is up in arms and is mobilizing to make sure that the definition of endocrine disruptors is as limited as possible, basically because they want to continue putting their products onto the market without any interference by the regulator. For Parliament, scientists and NGOs, finding a definition for endocrine disruptors is an emergency. However, the industry considers it a threat for thousands of products. But the responsibility for the final decision lies with the European Commission. Our destiny is in its hands. A battle breaks out behind the scenes of European democracy. This definition will concern all economic sectors, plastics, detergents, foodstuffs, Sent to the front line, the chemical and pesticide industry unite forces to cut losses. The formula for successful lobbying? Capture the public decision. Yet democracy, according to the Commission, consists in a dialogue with stakeholders. A code name for NGOs representing civil society and with industry representing industry. Sefik is the industry association in Brussels for the European chemical industry. And its uh, objective is to represent the interests of the industry uh, within the Brussels environment. And it um, has about a 40-year history of uh, doing that. And uh, we have about um, 150 people in, in total. We maybe have about 10 to 12 people possibly a, a few more in the various organizations following endocrine disruptors and the development of policy here in Brussels. L'industrie chimique a cette chance d'avoir suffisamment de moyens pour euh, démarcher absolument tout le monde, y compris leurs ennemis, y compris leurs alliés euh, et y compris les, ind les indécis, alors que typiquement les ONG, elles n'ont les moyens que de se focaliser sur les indécis. The way I see democracy uh, playing out in a situation like this in the thinking of where the commission is is that it's important to retain a dialogue at all times with all stakeholders who've got useful information. The European Commission and the member states pay attention to NGOs because they see us as the representative of the public interest. Um, but there are times when definitely it feels like we're a voice in the wilderness. In Brussels, lobbying targets decision makers who work in the offices of the European Commission. They are the Directorates General, known as the DGs. Each of them is in charge of a specific sector. DG Sanko, for example, is responsible for health and consumers. DG Enterprise for industry. DGs are headed by commissioners, super ministers, below the president, Jose Manuel Barroso, in the hierarchy. DG Environment is designated as the chef de file on the endocrine disruptor file. Welcome. Its job, to establish a list of scientific criteria in order to produce an identikit of the possible culprits and help get rid of them. This important responsibility is entrusted to a handful of civil servants in unit D3, fifth floor, end of the corridor, on the left. It's very similar to when we started regulating chemicals that cause cancer. That in the beginning, uh, we didn't even have a definition for what we meant with a chemical causing cancer. And we didn't have detailed criteria. The question is how to identify endocrine disruptors. What set of characteristics they have to fulfill that you, do you call these substances endocrine disruptors? The difficulty in developing criteria is, is uh, in, in the first instance, to understand what is the science, what's the state of science. DG Environment commissioned a study uh, 
to find out what was the latest science about endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, the, the group of people that got the contract to do this study was a, a group of people led by Professor Andreas Kortenkamp, who is one of the world's leading authorities on endocrine disrupting chemicals. <laughs> Hormones have various functions in our bodies, but during development they have a very important function which is programming. They program our development. And certain chemicals have the ability to interfere with these programming effects of hormones, for example in fetal life. And that can have uh, quite severe and irreversible consequences uh, for life into adulthood, for the rest of someone's life. For example, the fetus has to be exposed during a precise window to fetal androgens, the male sex hormone, and that triggers the differentiation of the male fetus into a male. If this doesn't happen, then we can expect various signs of demasculinization. For example, the urethra doesn't end up on the end of the penis as it should, but on the underside. So chemicals a pregnant mother is exposed to, to during these times uh, will disturb this and may have these uh, irreversible effects. And that is something that separates them from the toxicity of many other chemicals. Thank you. The report which we have written, the state-of-the-art assessment on endocrine disruptors, was uh, very positively and gladly received by the European Commission. What the report concludes is indeed that this is an issue which needs uh, policy um, attention and that the science base, and that was for us the, the, the very important uh, conclusion in the report, that the sci scientific basis for, for um, developing uh, legislation or for developing policy has significantly improved and is rather solid. Um, <clears throat> it was not so gladly received by, um, by industrial circles. No sooner published in early 2012, the Corton Camp report becomes the object of a series of attacks disguised as critiques. Most of these are financed by the industry and entrusted to scientific lobbying firms. The business of these companies is to produce scientific material used to convince the authorities in defense of dangerous products like bisphenol A, pesticides or cigarettes. Une des tactiques systématiques malheureusement employées par par l'industrie dans 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 cette dans cet exercice là Euh, c'est d'attaquer évidemment non seulement les études qui vont contre son sens, mais également les scientifiques qui sont les auteurs de ces études-là. When reading some of the critiques of the Court and Count report, one was struck by how easy it is to do a critique. You read a report of some hundreds of pages, 2,000 references, carefully prepared by not one but several scientists over a year or two, and over a weekend you can just write a piece that um, savages it and criticizes it, um, usually on the basis of, oh, this reference was not included. Of course, dissent and controversy is great for science and great for the public. We need to get, as it were, nearer to the truth uh, all the time. But these very rough, ready, shoddy, quickly penned critiques of large studies like the Corton Camp study uh, are not the sort of thing we want. It's clear that the overall uh, objective is a bit like what the tobacco industry realized decades ago, is, which is to, to manufacture doubt, to call into question the quality and to um, make it difficult for policymakers to take decisions. Since science is at the heart of many political decisions, it is the target of partisan influence in the corridors of democracy. Industry exploits science to delay, water down or fight regulations. Science lobbying is called manufacturing doubt. The strategy was invented by the tobacco industry in the 50s to prevent the implementation of public health measures against cigarettes. Policymakers need to be aware about the scope for manufacturing doubt, about where it comes from, 
explicit memos written by tobacco in the 50s saying, if we can plant doubt in the minds of the public and decision makers, we can secure another two or three decades for our product cigarettes. So it's a very explicit strategy, has been picked up by other groups who feel their products are threatened. La science est faite de débats contradictoires, euh, et c'est ce qui fait sa force d'ailleurs, c'est que c'est un processus de doute permanent, euh, qu'on a besoin de ce doute permanent, et c'est d'ailleurs très sain euh, d'un point de vue intellectuel de remettre en question ce qu'on pense de façon permanente. Et c'est là où c'est très pervers, c'est que en déformant artificiellement en fait et en amplifiant ce doute là, l'industrie parvient en fait à utiliser la science contre elle-même. Uncertainty is the driving force behind science. But to protect us, Europe has a political tool called the precautionary principle. It would take too long to prove the link between the cause endocrine disruptors and their effects, illnesses that develop eight months or 40 years later. We are not guinea pigs. Of course, proof has to come from either damaged um, wildlife or damaged humans or both. And to avoid it, one needs to be precautionary on evidence that's not 100% certain. So precaution comes in when you've got situations of complexity, uncertainty, scientific ignorance, in situations where there's enough evidence to suggest the plausibility, the possibility of perhaps very serious, widespread, irreversible problems like cancers or holes in, ozo holes in the ozone layer, that type of issue. The precautionary principle makes it possible to remove products from the market, which is a problem for business. Industry often uses the very same arguments to criticize the principle. Principe de précaution euh, appliqué de manière abusive empêche l'innovation. The precautionary principle um, stimulates innovation rather than inhibits it. And this works because we know there's a strong empirical base that says well-designed environmental regulations and green taxes stimulate innovation, mainly because it brings forth smarter alternatives. Je ne connais pas d'exemple de, de produit qui a été suspendu en raison du principe de précaution et qu'il soit revenu ensuite sur le marché. Donc ça, c'est vraiment une application abusive du principe de précaution. Of course, in any debate about the precautionary principle, the question arises, has it been um, overused or used inappropriately? With hindsight, we can see that there were opportunities and um, uh, justifications for taking action much, much earlier, decades, in fact, in, in many of the cases. The aim of chemical regulation in the European Union and any, uh, uh, anywhere else is to reveal dangers before exposures can happen. So we want to anticipate the dangers and want to make sure that exposures to humans never happen. This is ground control to future generations. Science is on our side. Endocrine disruptors are a textbook case for the application of the precautionary principle. But industry can always bypass it. If it does, we're lost. Watch out. The devil is in the details and lobbying can be hidden in super technical documents. Industry's first trick concerns the threshold question. In Europe, all chemicals must go through a sort of mill called REACH, an acronym for Registration, Evaluation, Authorization and Restriction of Chemicals. The European Commission has to decide which tube to put endocrine disruptors through. Tube number one, they're only dangerous above a certain threshold. Tube number two, they are dangerous full stop. This means that we need to look at the science, uh, try to understand it, and then make a decision on whether or not we think predom that predominantly uh, science shows that all endocrine disruptors have a threshold, or all endocrine disruptors do not have a threshold, or maybe some have a threshold and some don't have a threshold. Some people believe that if it can be shown that there is a threshold, then a decision on what is safe and what is not safe will be clear-cut. But that question is uh, uh, scientifically very difficult to answer and signs are uh, that uh, we cannot determine any safe level of exposure for these chemicals. 
First option, the Commission decides that there are no thresholds. In that case, endocrine disruptors would be banned and substituted. But nothing prevents the Commission from ignoring science and deciding that thresholds do exist. This is, of course, the second option that industry prefers. It would spare the majority of its products. So all they need to do is to persuade the Commission. I think industry wants to have the right answer. And we believe at the moment, since we have consider thresholds to be a, a very real uh, aspect of, of these substances, that the data will be presented to show where the thresholds are. The second trick is hidden in the criteria for endocrine disruptors. DG Environment is working hard on a list including the severity of the effects, the potency of the effects, the irreversibility of the effects. All criteria would contribute to the development of a scientific identikit of the suspects. The industry's trick would be to filter endocrine disruptors and only select the most potent ones, thus clearing all the others. Potency has some scientific uh, justification when, for example, I, I need to label and regulate acutely uh, toxic chemicals. Potency is important then. It is uh, getting more complicated when it comes to carcinogens, reproductive toxicants, mutagen. Then these, these toxicities, and of course endocrine disruption, these toxicities are judged to be so important and so dangerous that Potency is not considered anymore. You can have a lot of uh, very low potency chemicals that, if they hit the body at the, the most vulnerable time, are going to do their damage. They don't have to be mega potent to do their damage if they're there at the right time. Uh, so we think that using potency is, is just going the wrong way about it. It's the wrong indicator. I think that potency is very much a, a science-based idea. Uh, you can have uh, substances that behave in different ways and this idea of how much is needed to cause an effect is what potency is about. If we set up a system where we only take potent chemicals, it will essentially be a system that deals with some chemicals and not with others. And that seems to be something that would serve industry's purposes, and we don't necessarily believe it would serve as the purpose of protecting public health. The potency criteria may well only be an astute lobbying trick, but the industry has found heavyweight allies to help it. Germany and the United Kingdom. The uh, British authorities openly say that the labelling of a chemical as an endocrine disruptor has uh, enormous commercial consequences, which is true but therefore they want to regulate only the worst offenders. So the idea would be to use the criterion of potency as a tool to cream off from the top the worst offenders and leave the rest of endocrine disrupting chemicals totally unregulated. This potency trick is something the pesticide industry could do with. In 2009, Parliament concocted a personal mill for it and decided that all pesticides identified as endocrine disruptors should be withdrawn from the market. If industry manages to impose the potency criteria, it will be able to reduce the radical consequences of its mistreatment. Sur la base des 400 molécules aujourd'hui qui, qui restent en Europe pour euh, protéger l'ensemble des cultures, Euh, nous estimons, nous, aujourd'hui, qu'une euh, une bonne cinquantaine de substances pourraient être amenées à être considérées comme perturbateurs endocriniens et donc disparaître. Et ce sont des termes de... Ces 50 produits représentent aujourd'hui, globalement, 40% de la valeur du, du marché européen, qui est donc estimé entre 8 et 9 euh, milliards d'euros. That doesn't mean to say that agriculture will close down. There's, of course, alternatives. There's organic farming. There's, there's integrated pest management. But the various entities are looking at the implications of these criteria and, and conjugating those and saying, this will be bad for my business. Potency criteria or threshold? DG Environment refuses to give in to exterior pressure. But its resistance begins to cause concern within the European Commission itself. And its portrayal is organised under the Commission's very roof. 
two directorates general in particular are annoyed. DG Enterprise, which is responsible for the well-being of industry, and DG Sanko, in charge of health and consumers. But whose health? Sur la question des perturbateurs endocriniens, on a vu que la DG Environnement était plutôt dans la défense de la santé publique et la DG Santé et Consommateurs euh, moins, euh, beaucoup moins. What we know is that the pesticides industry has an open door anytime they want to see DG Sanko. And these are things that lead us to believe that part of DG Sanko's purposes is uh, not only to do their risk assessment and risk management, but to make sure that the pesticide industry isn't completely outraged with them, if I can put it that way. To general astonishment and without warning, DG Sanko initiates a parallel process in competition with the work of DG Environment. It mandates an official agency, the European Food Safety Authority, the EFSA. So the EFSA must also give its opinion on endocrine disruptors. An ingenious bureaucratic sleight of hand. If the EFSA validates the demands of the industry, DG Environment will have to change its course. Colleagues of mine said they were sure EFSA would uh, come out in favour of potency-based cutoff values as proposed by industry and various other um, uh, member states. It was clear that DG Environment was meant to be in charge of developing that, and they did. They had created an inclusive process. And, for, and it was Sanko that had delegated the task to environment. They could have said, no, 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 we want to do it. But then one, first you delegate it and then you create your parallel process is not uh, really very uh, good administration. Well, I think Shall you can take it. it. Yeah. That's fine. Um, we were informed more or less uh, at the same time as the request was made. Uh, uh, I don't have the dates. Not a single civil servant of DG Environment was sent a copy of the mandate signed by the director of DG Sanko on the 1st of August 2012. No, we received it a few days afterwards, uh, indeed. No comment from DG Sanko on this brutal short circuit. Its director, Paola Testori Koji, cancels our interview at the last moment. The official explanation? The commission spokesman does not understand, he says, why several people need to be interviewed. In support, DG Enterprise also refuses to give an interview. On the pretext that the Commission has only one voice, DG Environment is forced to fake a love affair, when in fact everyone sleeps in a different room. The reason why they didn't want to be interviewed or answering your request, uh, well, we've decided within the Commission on your request that uh, we in DG Environment, having the lead on the file of endocrine disruption, uh, should uh, perform this interview with you and give you all the feedback that we can on uh, behalf of our colleagues in the different services. And finally, there is no trace of any potency criteria in the EFSA's report. DG Sanko's little game is a fiasco. Potency-based cutoff values are arbitrary. They are not supported by scientific evidence and accordingly EFSA like everyone else, uh, saw this and came out not recommending them strongly. Under siege by the lobbies, pressed by some member states and now isolated within the Commission, DG Environment still refuses to give in to pressure. In March 2013, the European Parliament sends in reinforcements. It doesn't have much power over the Commission, but adopts a resolution 
asking it to reject the ideas of a threshold and a cut-off criterion such as potency. Most of all, it calls for urgent action. The Parliament thought this is an important moment to provide also the view of Parliament to the Commission, so to give its political input, um, because it had become clear due to the heavy lobbying of especially the UK and, and, and Germany representing industry interests of the, of the pesticides industry, um, that the Commission was under, under pressure. So without this resolution, we would probably be in a far worse situation. La Commission peut tout à fait concrètement s'asseoir dessus si elle a envie. Elle le fait pas en général parce que politiquement c'est suicidaire, mais elle peut dire oui merci, on va regarder ça tout de suite et puis ne rien répondre dans les six mois, dans les dans, dans les 18 mois, etc. At the end of May 2013, DG Environment brings three years of work to a close. It submits its proposition to the whole European Commission. It hasn't given in. Exit the threshold and the potency criterion. Au revoir, endocrine disruptors in potatoes and dolls. At last, we can be born in peace. But DG Sanko's betrayal was in fact just a warning. All of a sudden, nothing. Blackout. Total paralysis. Something must have happened in the European Commission. I'm not privy to this, uh, to this debate, but someone must have pulled a break. Uh, because all of a sudden, uh, what surfaced was the idea of having to conduct a so-called impact assessment. Everyone knows impact assessments uh, in the European Union take at least a year, if not longer. Why now? Why does this happen uh, half a year before the deadline uh, set by the European Parliament to the European Commission. Since our whole activity up until June was based on developing science-based criteria, we had not made very many efforts on the economic part. We also need to take into account that what we do may have a negative impact on the economy, and we have to make our decisions aware of that impact. Hey, hey, no, I'm, hey. Conceptuellement, c'est assez fumeux comme truc. Il faut essayer d'imaginer ce que pourrait être l'impact dans le futur d'une réglementation sur un secteur économique entier à l'échelle d'un continent. We know from the history of previous efforts to do cost-benefit analyses, impact assessments, that they are deeply flawed, generally speaking, because it is much easier to put numbers on costs of regulation than it is to put numbers on what are the benefits to society over the next four or five decades of not having uh, reproductive problems. And of course we need industries to provide jobs, we need industries to provide the products so that our society functions. But we believe that ultimately um, having well-functioning industries won't help us if we've got a pandemic of chronic diseases, if we've got food that's making us sick, if we've got water that's contaminated. We're talking about the identification of what is an endocrine disruptor. This should be a science-based procedure. So evidence-based policy making. What we see here now is policy-based evidence making. What's got into the commission? And what about its promise to spare our prostates and our mammary glands? European law is sometimes well made. We citizens can insist on explanations and make a freedom of information request. Hundreds of partly censored internal documents help reconstitute the lobbying operation that took the whole process off the rails at the beginning of summer 2013. On the 6th of June, the chemical, pesticide and plastic lobbies are still trying to make DG Environment capitulate. They write to complain that the current discussion appears to be based more on political rather than scientific considerations. For such an important decision with an enormous potential and significant impact on many substances and their uses, we strongly urge that any outcome is based on sound science and not on political interests. Il faut que euh, les critères 
qui vont dire « vous êtes exclus » soient des critères euh, basés sur une science euh, raisonnable, la fameuse euh, « sound science » des anglo-saxons. There's a term used very frequently in these debates about the appropriate use of precaution and so on, uh, which is the phrase sound science, which really, who could argue with that? Uh, who wants to propose or support unsound science? But it's a term whose historical origins are very interesting. It too was invented by the tobacco industry in the 80s. C'est quelque chose qui est utilisé comme un mot slogan, comme un espèce de mot au but pour disqualifier toute étude scientifique qui n'irait pas dans leur sens. Donc tout ce qui est, euh, disons, dans, qui va dans le sens de l'industrie, c'est sound science, et tout ce qui ne va pas dans le sens de l'industrie, c'est de la junk science, c'est de la science pourrie. And one problem, of course, with sound science is that the current generation of policymakers, uh, they're for the most part not aware of where it comes from, i.e. a PR strategy from the tobacco industry. The lobbies dig into the tobacco industry toolbox once more, leaving a strange impression of déjà vu. But turning the sense of words around isn't enough, and the chemical industry strikes higher up the ladder. On the 24th of June, it writes to Janusz Potosznik, the European Commissioner for the Environment. Nous persistons à penser que les critères techniques pour identifier les perturbateurs endocriniens devraient être basés sur les données et sur la science, et pas sur des hypothèses et l'idéologie. Euh, D'accord. <rire> c'est exact. Voilà, ça c'est la sound science. C'est euh, tant qu'on n'est pas, tant que vous n'êtes pas d'accord avec nous, vous êtes des idéologues. Um, this here is a reflection that at least we were not there yet in getting a common understanding with our colleagues from industry. Quand ils, quand ils sortent ce genre d'argument, c'est qu'ils ont perdu. En tout cas, avec ce, cet interlocuteur-là, je ne pense pas qu'ils utilisent le même ton pour avoir des gens entreprises. Is this intimidation? Oui. There are two elements of this uh, letter. As an example of the many letters that we've gotten, there's the, the, the tone which you uh, refer to, and there's the content. And of course, our professional duty is to respond to the content and avoid uh, looking at the tone. No need to raise the voice with those DGs, which are more receptive to economic blackmail, especially at the beginning of summer 2013. The EU and the US are negotiating the creation of a transatlantic trade and investment partnership, the TTIP. The objective? To remove the barriers for commercial exchange. How? By aligning regulations. But aligning them upwards, Europe, or downwards, United States. The definition of endocrine disruptors comes at a rather bad time. American goods blocked at the frontiers by the precautionary principle? This barrier to innovation, putting a brake on progress? Inconceivable for the industry. There are many differences, and clearly business is wishing that some of these differences be, uh, be, uh, be ironed away or be, uh, be removed. What is in jeu is the remise on the table of all our heritage uh, regulatory de, de the 40 years. années. Euh, donc ça inclut évidemment euh, l'encadrement des produits chimiques, REACH. Ça permet également aussi à l'industrie, et c'est évidemment très intéressant pour l'industrie chimique, pour l'industrie, enfin pour tous ceux qui sont euh, sur les perturbateurs endocriniens, sur les EGM, de pouvoir régler euh, dans des négociations secrètes euh, des débats qu'ils ont perdus ou qu'ils sont en train de perdre dans le débat public. Where there are issues that are being hotly debated, like the criteria for endocrine disruptors, one sees very strong voices now also from the pesticides industry from the US. Get rid of the precautionary principle and solve the endocrine disruptor problem behind closed doors. The industry is quite clear about its intentions, but the Commission much less. DG Trade, which is in charge of negotiations with the TTIP, only produces three censored documents. It justifies this by saying that making the others public would endanger our relations with the United States. If there is a chemical issue and if there is an issue concerning endocrine disruptors, we are consulted. Now, regarding the actual content of the negotiations, um, I can't reveal, uh, I, I, I cannot reveal very much. On pourrait s'attendre à ce que les parlementaires élus euh, qui en sont en théorie souverains, enfin qui en théorie ont, ont quand même le droit, enfin sont censés incarner quand même euh, Notre liberté collective, à nous, citoyens, euh, est un droit de regard sur ces trucs-là. A priori, les parlements nationaux ne seront même pas consultés euh, pour cet accord-là. 
the industry gets round the DG environment pocket of resistance. The most influential DGs are now its allies, and it's reaching higher and higher up inside the commission. Here, people aren't familiar with the file. Here, the industry's emails are the only source of information. Here, they can convince people to freeze the process and make an impact assessment. Here, they only need to give a scientific veneer to their arguments to perfect the blackmail. Les fongicides, par exemple, permettent euh, de, de contribuer à la protection euh, du rendement en blé, et c'est 10 à 20% du rendement en blé qui pourrait euh, disparaître si ces produits n'étaient plus utilisés. This is from Biocrop Science, which is a, a branch of Bayer Company, chemical company, German, writing to the Secretary General, uh, which is sort of the, um, the service directly under the President. And what he, this letter is saying is that Bayer believes that we should do an impact assessment on the, uh, um, on the work that we're doing regarding criteria development and its implementation. This letter from Bayer, a chemical and pesticide corporation, is addressed to number three of the Secretary General, Marianne Klingbeil, who is in charge of impact assessments. On the 2nd of July, number two, Catherine Day, makes a decision in favor of the industry. The impact assessment will be launched. Uh, uh. <laughs> If the Secretary General, who is the highest civil servant, says, I want an impact assessment, then that's it. Les différentes DG ne s'étant pas mises d'accord, la Commission a décidé de faire une étude d'impact. Alors, quel a été le rôle euh, et le, le poids, je dirais, de la proposition de l'industrie, là, je ne peux pas vous dire. Sherlock speaking. The Commission missed the two deadlines in June and December 2013 and the impact assessment hasn't even started. An impact assessment takes more than a year. So the final decision is postponed. Till when? We'll be born soon. What's going to happen to us? Nous regrettons le fait qu'il y a un retard dans le, dans le planning, mais ce retard étant expliqué par la nécessité de faire une étude d'impact, c'est le côté positif. Donc nous sommes aujourd'hui un peu balancés entre regret et euh, satisfaction de voir l'étude d'impact. Notre objectif, c'est de faire en sorte que les réglementations qui soient euh, votées et donc applicables soient des réglementations équilibrées, euh, basées sur la science et qui permettent suffisamment de, de lisibilité à l'ensemble des acteurs, société civile, mais aussi et surtout l'industrie. Or what Il est, il est trop tôt aujourd'hui pour dire euh, si l'industrie pourra ou ne pourra pas attaquer euh, la, 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 la Commission européenne, puisqu'on n'a pas encore le, le projet final. Je trouve logique néanmoins qu'en euh, cas de besoin, des actions juridiques soient mises en œuvre. In February 2014, after nine months of silence, the European Commission decides to justify the delay. The excuse? Too much scientific doubt about endocrine disruptors. If it wasn't about the integrity of our testicles, it would be almost comic. Its alibi? An editorial published in several scientific journals and a letter sent to the top floor of the Commission. The authors defend the same point of view as the industry on thresholds, and they attack the precautionary approach of DG Environment. Coincidentally, this operation took place in June 2013, at the height of the industry lobbying offensive. Scientifically unfounded precaution drives the European Commission's recommendations on EDC regulation, endocrine disruptor and chemical regulation, while defying common sense, well-established science and risk assessment principles. This reads like the title of an industry attack or a podium discussion. This is not a title that you would normally uh, have for, uh, for a scientific editorial. This editorial by, uh, was, was accompanied by a letter to the um, scientific advisor of uh, Commission President Barroso, uh, Professor Anne Glover. The chief scientific advisor advises the president of the commission. So she's in the upper echelons of the commission. 
what the, the letter was saying is that they felt that there was a danger of the Commission focusing too much on the precautionary principle in their review of regulation around endocrine disrupting chemicals. In other words, making the regulation much tighter so that uh, many chemicals perhaps would have to be withdrawn from use. The letter contained some, uh, to me, quite surprising uh, errors in fact. For example, the claim that the European Commission wants to regulate endocrine disruptors solely on the basis of culture dish essays, which is uh, absolutely not true and I can only uh, express surprise at uh, some of my dear colleagues who've also signed this letter that they didn't spot this. Professor Glover invited representatives of the two camps to debate this in her offices. But once in the office, surprise, surprise, the authors of the editorial had admitted their mistakes and changed opinions about the threshold issue. So why mobilise a whole regiment just to do a vault fast a few months later? Was this some kind of a sick joke? Change of heart, change of mind? I do not know. Or am I too cynical to say, doesn't matter anymore, damage done? The sad thing is that it did contribute to questioning what DG Environment did and did contribute to all of this now being subject to, to an impact assessment. The intervention um, by the editors and the letter to Glover was designed to um, interfere with the regulatory processes of the European Commission. It was a political act. I don't know whether all of this was engineered by the industry or not, or, uh, but it's, uh, it's so unusual that uh, it really questions the credibility of those scientists. When you look closer, almost none of these scientists is a specialist in endocrine disruption, though the majority do have close links with the industry. This was the case for 17 out of 18 authors of the editorial, and for 33 of the 56 signatories of the letter to Anne Glover. A motley crowd, linked to chemical and pesticide giants like Bayer and BASF, and organisations financed by cosmetic and food processing corporations. And, oh yes, there are even a few veterans from the tobacco industry among them. For me, it is not a bad thing if scientists have some kind of interactions with industry. If you're a research scientist and you have at, had at some time a research project with industry, it does not mean you're an employee of that industry. There does arise the issue of conflicts of interest, of course. If you're being paid by the person defending their product, you're hardly as objective as, let's say, a scientist employed by society through government agencies, where your bias, if you have one, is towards the public or the planet. We are aware of the support of the European taxpayer. We are grateful for it. And, our, uh, and we are striving to give something back to make life uh, better in the European Union. Uh, I have no illusion uh, about our range and our power to do so. Uh, we are scientists, we are not lobbyists. Whether we consider it a lobbying operation, I would say no. I, I'm not familiar with the construction of that letter or anything. À ce que je sache, euh, le CPA n'a rien à voir avec cet éditorial. Et aussi le CPA, ou si l'avis de, de le CPA a été pris en compte dans l'éditorial, eh ben, c'est plutôt bien. Lobbying means being at the right moment with at the right with the right person with the right message. Anne Glover, June 2013. The process has to stop. The right person, the right message, the right moment. With this scientific guarantee at the summit, the Commission had its alibi for the impact assessment, even if the pseudo-scientific controversy had been a big flop in its own offices. We feel that perhaps the, uh, that post is being misused to enter economic and political debates rather than sticking to the science. I see in the press all the time people making statements that I'm in the pocket of industry or I work for industry, I just don't, nor have I ever done. Le fait même que, cette, que ce poste existe est un enjeu stratégique qui intéresse l'industrie et qu'ils veulent pouvoir utiliser dans l'avenir. I'm not 
the voice of industry. I'm not the voice of politics. I'm not the voice. What I am is the voice of science. Cette notion même qu'on pourrait avoir un, un conseiller en chef scientifique euh, auprès de la commission pose problème parce que d'abord, qu'est-ce que c'est qu'un chef de la science Il y a de plus en plus de décideurs. Et moralité, il y a de moins en moins de décisions qui se prennent. Ou au pire, on prend des décisions négatives, principe de précaution. So, would you like a sound science chief in the commission? Bah oui. What I guess I would like to leave people with is a sense of of the magnitude of the importance of this issue. This isn't just some obscure toxicological debate that's happening in some corner of the EU. I'm always searching for good ways to explain this, but we're essentially looking at, you know, uh, I believe the equivalent of climate change in, in environmental health in terms of hazardous chemicals. We're looking at a mother of all battles. The attack of the industry shows that we are on track, that we are doing the right thing. Uh, uh, otherwise, they wouldn't react like that. Now we just have to win the battle. April 2014. Things are still blocked. The impact assessment hasn't begun. Europe has no official definition. There is still no regulation for endocrine disruptors. While they defend their profits, others fight in their offices. But have these ladies and gentlemen forgotten who they are talking about? Their daughters, your grandsons. It's about us.